Isn't it remarkable for you, and maybe somewhat poignant, that it was this very stage, over 30 years ago, Waza Albert was opening, Mbongeni Ngemo was not even a household name, mm. and you are back full circle with the Zulu. It, it's incredible. It's, it's, uh, it's life, you know, it's like you, you've, you, you, you've gone full cycle with your life. Uh, it was in this very theater that we did Waza Albert before Mbongeni Ngemo was the name, and it broke out. Uh, we started at a smaller theater next door, the Lager, mm. and then we went to the, what used to be called Kramadulas. It was not a restaurant then. Okay. And it was amazing because when we performed, because the, the, the window, the people outside, there would be an audience inside and an audience outside <laughs> standing and watching. And wow. I remember one night there was mm. a full moon. Mm. It was as though the moon was part of the lighting design. Amazing. And, and then we came back for the third season and we were in this theater mm. and we kept on coming back to this. We tour the country, tour the world and come back to mm. this theater. Mm. So, in a way, this is home. More than just a home uh, like other actors because before Waza Albert, while we were still rehearsing Waza Albert, because Percy and I had been uh, in, in detention, proud to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, while we were writing the play, we got uh, detained in the trans guy as political suspects yeah. were also undesirable, deemed undesirable elements in the community. <laughs> I wonder why. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we spent some time in jail uh, under the uh, suppression of the of Terrorism Act, mm. where, where it allowed the police to detain you without trial for 90 days. Wow and if they have to renew it after 90 days, so be it. Uh, but anyway, coming back to the play at the Market Theatre, then when I got to Johannesburg, because I didn't have a home in Johannesburg, uh, the only home I had way before then was at Gibson Cantor's yes. uh, at Dube. Yeah, While I was with Gibson Cantor, I was staying at his home. So because now I had left Gibson, I had no home. And my home was those uh, red seats at the bar. Right up front. Right up front. And I remember many men uh, who was the founder of the Market Theatre and, and also the managing director of the Market Theatre. Every night when he left me, he would say, Mongeni, this is, if ever you have to go to the toilet at night, mm -hmm. this is the route you take to the toilet. Because otherwise the alarm will go off. And then John Foster Square, which is right next door, they will be right here at the door and they have a key to the theatre. They will find you inside and they will ask for your passbook. And that will be enough for you to be arrested. And indeed, I followed those instructions night after night, slept at the market theatre for months until we opened Rosa Albert, and the, re the rest is history. The rest is a tremendous history. Yeah. Because your life was never the same after that. Never, absolutely. You know, when we opened, it was. Uh, it coincided with the elections, the mm. whites only mm. elections. Mm. Remember, For the National Party back then, the, yes. The National Party mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mandela was in, in jail, so, uh, so were many other political uh, prisoners that were like Bosu Sulu, yep. Govan and Beggy. Mm. And there was then this talk about, you know, the journalists would go and cover the elections, mm -hmm. which had nothing to do with black people. And after that, they would say, where can one go to in South Africa? I mean, journalists from all over the world. Yes. BBC being one of them, mm -hmm. CBS, C uh, there was no CNN then. Uh, it was NBC and Australian television and, and newspapers, yes. and London Times. Yeah. Uh, the whole foreign press. The whole foreign mm. press. Then, as they would tell us, they were told that if you want to know about South Africa, go to the market theatre. There is a play called Waza Albert that's playing there. And after opening night, Waza Albert was splashed worldwide by the world media yeah. as a contrast to what was happening in the country, yes. the votes for the National Party. Mm. And of course, we got invitations all over the world at the same time. Uh, many, many would say, hey, Mbongeni, there's another, there were telegrams those days, there were no <laughs> emails. <laughs> Say, there's goodness, a new, there's yeah. another telegram, this just come in. Yeah. The play is wanted in Australia, the play is wanted in New York, the play is wanted in London. Yes. And in, indeed our first stop, 
my first trip overseas was in London. We, we went to shoot a, a, a document, it was a documentary on Wars Albert. The BBC had followed us mm. inside the country mm -hmm. and then uh, as about how the play was created, okay. filming actual characters in the streets wow. where we would go to and find mm -hmm. these characters. That would be like a reality series in It was like terms. a reality series yes, in today's yes, terms, yes. of course. And, and, and BBC One edit, and of course that created such an interest in England for yeah. the play. Uh, and then we performed in London, uh, then we ended up on the West End where we played Was Albert for more than a year on the West End. Then we proceeded to the United States and, and all over the world. So it was, it all came from this theatre. Exactly. And it all came from those seats of the bar where I used to sleep. <laughs> But now, at that point, when the world is embracing you, essentially, and so many possibilities are coming, and you've moved from that point to come up with other works, you were leaving home kind of uh, an imperfect scenario. Mm. How did you feel about being so far away, knowing what was going on to the country, knowing what was going on in your personal life? You know, I tell you, I got to understand South Africa better when I was outside. Because when you were inside South Africa, it, it was like, oh yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. You are born under this system. You know it's not right. It doesn't feel right because other people, especially when, when I grew up as a young boy, I remember at about five, six years of age, in Verulam, I had a, a, a white friend who was the same age as mine. And we used to go to the cinema together. And one day, we went to the cinema uh, in Verulam at Laxmi Theatre. And there was a sign outside that was written, no bandu. So he had bought the two tickets for us to go and watch a movie. And as we were walking in, the guys at the door stopped us and said, no, blacks are no more allowed in this theatre. We looked at each other and we, we said, what's going, what's wrong with us? Yeah. He's, he, the boy said, he's my friend, I'm going with him. Yeah. And I couldn't go in, I was stopped. Mm. That was my first impression of apartheid. This is when, when they introduced Group Areas Act. And we were then moved out of Verulam. Mm. Uh, the township of Kwamash was then built. So my family was then moved. And you were um, detached? Detached, completely. Yes. So I lost all my friends mm -hmm. and everybody mm -hmm. I was going mm -hmm. to school with at, at, at that time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course then my father decided, you know what, let me take my children back to Zululand. Mm -hmm. So that they can, because it was abnormal. The townships were just being introduced. Yeah. So no one knew how it would be like to live in these four-roomed yes, houses yes, yes. with people you don't even know. Yes. Uh, but then, as, as one grew up, of course, it became normal to live under apartheid. We would protest it, but we knew that was the lie. But being outside South Africa and seeing how other nations live, it, be it became such a glaring picture that actually what's happening in South Africa is so wrong. Yeah. So whenever we came back, we were even more motivated to fight, to be in the liberation struggle. Yeah. Yeah. To, to use our craft as liberators. And indeed, you know, uh, uh, when we were traveling all over the world, we became a voice mm. for the ANC yeah. in particular, and for the PAC, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because uh, those days... It was one movement. It, those days, uh, <coughs> yes, it was mm. one, whether it was PAC Absolute or ANC, it didn't one matter. One movement, yes. Was the, the, the cause was the same. Mm. Uh, but the world was not paying attention to what the movement was saying, because no one was reporting exactly what was going on in South Africa wow. until we brought out these plays. Yes. Then the world began to realize how wrong apartheid was. And, and, and therefore, the ANC and the PAC rallied around us wherever we were. Understanding now how you, you became somewhat of a creative freedom fighter. That all was fused behind Serafina, would you say? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that was a magical moment. I mean, at that time, 
I, I had traveled internationally so much and I had I knew the impact of my work internationally. And so when I created Sarafina uh, I knew that it would it, it was for the world. Uh -huh. It was for uh, international consumption as well as it was for home. But I also had another desire because <clears throat> Rosa Albert and, and, and Asina Mali was just drama, straight play. And I started as a, I'm a musician, basically, <laughs> tent, tent writer, tent actor. Absolutely. Uh, with Sarafina, I wanted to celebrate the spirit of Mpantlana, South African music, mm -hmm. and, and show the world, because this music was not really known out there. Uh, I had been talking to even Joseph Shabalala, encouraging him. Mm -hmm. I, I used to carry Lady Smith Black Mambazo albums all over the world where mm -hmm. I went, mm -hmm. and I would give them to producers and promoters and say, listen to this group. Yeah, yeah. You know, in fact, Joseph, when, uh, whenever I told him, people love your music overseas, he would say, I don't know, you're lying now. <laughs> <laughs> More of Mongeni stories. <laughs> sure. So with Sarafina, not only did I want to tell the story of the, the children of 1976 mm. and what was going on around the country at that time. The country was in play, mm. but I also wanted to celebrate my kind music. Yeah. And it showed, showed it that. As you were becoming more popular and popular, you started really now attracting a lot of interest, obviously, to the local press, and a lot of piercing started to happen. Mm. Looking behind the veil of the star, the big showman, mm. Bong and Ngema. Mm. And, 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 and how did you reconcile some of the reactions about, oh, Mbogeni is a bit of a tough one, we think the actors are being exploited. I mean, you've had your fair share of attacks from the media. How did you handle it? And you see, because I never uh, was hiding the fact that I'm tough with artists, mm. it didn't bother me. Because it's the only way out. Uh, if you are too nice to artists, they're never going to do their work. <laughs> and my, my shows were not going to be that excellent mm. if I wasn't tough with mm. artists. So mm. I'm very hard when it comes to artists. Mm -hmm. And that I will never depart from. <laughs> <laughs> You're known to hold, you know, hold on to your guns. I mean, yeah. let's talk a little bit about just, uh, and I'll just pu pull out one highlight um, when the uh, song Amandia came out. I mm. mean, some people who know you well are like, oh, well, that's in Boeing. And he tells it like it is. But you get into a lot of trouble for it. Yes, I did get into a lot of trouble for it. And I got to be hated by some section of the population. Yes, exactly. Which is fine. OK. You know, because, hey, if Christ could die for, the, for our sins, <laughs> <laughs> who am I? Oh, is that, is that the thing? <laughs> but I mean, I mean, how do you respond to that? Because. You see, the, the, the point is that I have been witnessing the exploitation of the African people by the Indians. Mm. And I was never going to keep quiet about that. If I wasn't quiet about the exploitation of the black people by white people mm. during apartheid, mm -hmm. why would I change and, and, and say, well, I'm not going to talk about the Indians? Like some politicians chose to do, mm. to actually uh, uh, cover it up and pretend as though I was lying. When they themselves, yes. behind the scenes, in the passages, and when we meet in the planes and the mm. airports, mm. say to me, you are so right. Is that what you say? Exactly. They would say that to they you. They would say that to me. Mm. But in the media, because they are politicians, they have to look good. Uh -huh. They would say, oh. How could Mbongeni say that? Uh -huh. Because they, you know, they think they will win votes. Mm -hmm. and, and I say I would rather lose votes and tell the truth mm -hmm. than win the votes and lie about the sufferings of the people. So you maintain it was all about board. You maintain? To this day, mm -hmm. I maintain it. No apologies. No apologies. Absolutely nothing. Remarkable. Take it or leave it. <laughs> I, I admire that kind of boldness. Now let me, let me ask you, in, in a country like ours with a young democracy, People often get afraid to challenge the status quo. Do you think you're just misunderstood or do you not heed the voice of those who say you can't be reckless and throw such blanket statements? Uh, 
Someone has to say it. Someone has to be the voice of the voiceless. Because someone out there in the street is not interesting to a television camera. Yeah. But he has a story to tell. So those who who will attract the media and even attract controversy, yeah. let it be them who will tell the story of that poor person out there. What followed next was the big controversy of, oh, we've given you so much government money, Mongeni, how could Sarafina too be this, etc., etc. It, it seemed like a troubled time for you in, 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 in a sense of getting favor of not only your audience, but even the media all at the same time. Mm. What was going on for you personally? And, and set the record straight, what really went down? Well, what really went down was that the ANC was not ready to rule the country. Uh-huh. Unpack that, yeah. They, 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 they got scared when the DA at the time, who they were not used to, mm. started raising. I mean, remember, you have to remember that white people had ruled this country for more than 40 years. Oh, wild, yeah. So they knew the inner workings of government. No matter what you do, if, if you, if you, if you, if you uh, publicize a tender, you know who you want to give that tender to. Uh -huh. Because you, who could compete with me anyway? <laughs> I hear what you say. You so, are the only obvious choice, you say. Yes, mm. so, so in other words, they should have just stood their ground and said, he's the one we want. In fact, we don't even want him to tender. We appoint him. Mm to do it because he's the one, A, who has an audience. Yes. We know that if he does it, everybody will want to see it mm -hmm. because he has a name, he has the audience. He, we know he'll do the right job. But, you know, the, the, the NC-led government at the time, you know, including Matiba, mm -hmm. you know, they got cold shivers as if they had made a mistake. Do you feel you were let down? You were hung out to dry? Well, I feel that they were cowards. They just let, let me bite the bullet. And, and, and indeed, I faced it on my own. Yeah. And I conquered. <laughs> Which you always seem to do. <laughs> Which you always seem to do.